Procedural oriented programming is a really, really common and popular paradigm. Really, for most people, it's the first approach to programming they learn. And this approach relies on you, when you get a problem, break it down, decomposing it into different subroutines. So your solution will hopefully be built up of quite a few subroutines which work together to solve your problem. So decomposition is quite a well-known approach to solving problems and procedural programming is using it with their own subroutines. Now just so we're on the same page because the terminology can vary a bit, a subroutine is a named block of code that should, if you're following this paradigm, perform just one task. And the idea of this is using its name, you can call it whenever you need it. So you define it once, it does one job, you call it whenever you need it. And a, a final procedural program will have lots of these together. Now a procedure is a type of subroutine. We often teach it like a procedure doesn't return a value, whereas a function does return a value. That's all true. The name procedural reflects the fact that often these words are used interchangeably. When we say procedural oriented programming, that includes functions and procedures or just subroutines to give it a more general name. Now when we're designing procedural programs, we sometimes make hierarchy charts or most likely in an exam, you'll have to deal with hierarchy charts. So these are very simple diagrams representing how subroutines relate to each other. So mostly the order in which they call each other because a complicated program with lots of subroutines, they'll, be, they'll call each other, they'll become kind of nested subroutines and so a hierarchy chart is meant to show that connection. So just to give you an example, here is some Python code. I've got two subroutine definitions, main menu and view players. I've also got a fair few subroutine calls, so I've not shown the definitions of most of these because it's just a bit of example code. It's for like a, a video game where I've got a main menu, I'm calling different options in this main menu, is my thinking. Well, how would I put this as a hierarchy chart? So what you do, the first box you draw, and it will be a rectangle with the identifier of your subroutine, so the name of your subroutine. The first one you put down at the very top is the first subroutine to get called in this code. So in this particular bit of code, the first line which gets ran is a main menu at the bottom, which is a subroutine call, and it's a call of main menu. So I'm putting down main menu as my first option. It's not because it's my first definition, it's just coincidence that it is. The definitions aren't looked at until we actually call one of them. Okay, so it's not the top definition, it's the first one being executed. Now, as the word hierarchy would suggest, we are sort of working our way down and looking at what comes next. So inside main menu, once it's been called, what other subroutine calls do we have? Well, we're calling view players, which I have got defined here. We're also calling add player, which I haven't shown here, but is another subroutine. We can tell because it's it's got the call structure we're familiar with, the name, then brackets. And we've also got quick game. Now, print is a subroutine, but we don't really care about it because it's not a, a user-defined one, it's built in, and so we don't put it down usually in a hierarchy chart. Now we connect these up just with lines, so the line's not an arrow, just a line, it's connected up to the subroutine which called it. So we can start to see this hierarchy, we start our main menu, main menu can then call one of these three subroutines. Now, it is one of those three, right? One gets called at a time. It's not a chain because it's an if, elif, else structure. Only one is getting called at any given point. And now the hierarchy chart just builds and builds as you have more complexity. So I've only shown another definition for view players. I haven't shown and player and quick game. So let's assume they haven't got any other subroutine calls. In view players, I've also called a subroutine called load players and another one called display players. And so again, they sit under view players, they only get called within it, and so they are below it in the hierarchy chart. Now, this is quite a, a typical tree structure. It's not always a pretty tree like this. It will, you, you start at the top with your first call, but sometimes you might get lines going back on each other, you might have lines connecting up, you might have it kind of deviating a little bit. It just depends on our structure. It's not always as picturesque as this one. Now procedural programming is a paradigm, but so is structured programming, and it's a bit murky which one came first, it's not that important, we're going back to the 1950s, 1960s at this point, but you should be when you're coding in a procedural way, ideally making your code as structured as possible, 
And the structured approach as time has gone on has included a few key characteristics, which are a sign your program is well written, essentially. So you should be aiming to include these in any code we're writing. So key aspects of this include just having a very clear control flow. Our three basic constructs in procedural languages are sequence, selection, and iteration. You should be using those as much as possible. Now, in the early days of programming, go-to statements were really popular. This is where you would jump around between different lines. You could just go, go to, line, whatever, and it would just go back to that line and keep running. And over time, this would get really, really messy and really confusing. The instruction of selection and iteration in particular was meant to make this a lot clearer, so you're not just randomly jumping around all the time. It's a clear block. Recursion is kind of the fourth programming construct, which if you're a purist for structured programming, you would try and avoid. Part of the reason why structured paradigm and procedural oriented programming are really the same thing nowadays is because of subroutines. So we should be using subroutines with clear interfaces. Now this isn't always ironically clear. The interface of a subroutine is what you interact with when you call it. So when you call a subroutine like name, in this case, which is the name of my subroutine, you're gonna give it a parameter. So the parameter or parameters is your input to that subroutine and is part of its interface. And also, if it returns a value, if it's a function, you could consider that part of the interface as well. So the point is, you've got this clear definition of what parameters you need and what's going to get returned. That's what you need to focus on. You don't need to worry about what's inside the subroutine as long as you're happy with the interface. And related to this, subroutines should be loosely coupled. This means one subroutine should not negatively affect another subroutine. They should be very independent and almost disconnected. The only connection being through the interface. In practice, this means minimal use of global variables. If you've got a variable which is global, this means it applies to every other subroutine in that program. And so as soon as you use a global variable, when you change it, that's when it can start to affect another subroutine because another subroutine might rely on that value which is now being changed. Whereas if you've got parameters and local variables and return values, it reduces the risk of it affecting another subroutine because it's contained just to that subroutine call. When you've got loads of subroutines, you're meant to use modules to group them. And now a module can be a separate code file, it could be a library, it could be a section within your code, but way of grouping related subroutines makes things more logical, makes things more structured. And just consistency as a final point is really important. So consistent identifier names, consistent style of programming, consistent use of commenting makes it more readable. Which is really the, one of the purposes, one of the advantages of following the structured approach, that it makes it more readable, makes the code easier to understand. Now also, if you've got these nice chunks of code in subroutines, if each subroutine is independent and loosely coupled, to debug it, you just focus on that one subroutine and you can test it using just that one subroutine can really break stuff down and focus on individual areas, not having to test the entire code because it, you haven't structured it very well. And use of subroutines generally leads to there being less repeated code. You just define it once and call it whenever you need it. You're not copying and pasting the same code again and again. And because the subroutines are ideally loosely coupled and pretty independent, that means if you've got more than one programmer working on this project, they can take their own subroutines, work on them on their own, and then at the end, combine them and it should all fit together, ideally, nice and well. Now, despite this being a very popular approach to programming and it's what you get taught, um, what everyone gets taught essentially, criticisms of this approach are that because global variables are not banned necessarily, you can use them, they can lead to side effects where one subroutine affects another subroutine unintentionally. And these bugs can be really, really hard to fix because you're not always sure exactly what's causing it, especially if you've got maybe hundreds of subroutines working together. And this issue can affect data integrity. There, aren't, there isn't much protection of data within this system, which when you compare it to object-oriented, where you can encapsulate data and keep attributes private, is quite a stark contrast. So that's the main criticism is why object-oriented programming is, is popular in certain circles.